Welcome. Uh, yeah, warm welcome from the team here at Cloud Essentials. Uh, we're going to talk co-pilot. So the last six months or so, loads of headlines about co-pilot, Microsoft 365 co-pilot. It, it's still in early access program right now and from news release this week, it looks like maybe November uh, release for enterprise customers, whether it's just for certain aspects of it, we will see. But we felt the time was right to just start helping our clients think about it because, you know, as a Microsoft partner, that's our job um, to help you make those connections between new Microsoft developments and your business. Uh, so I'm your host for the next 45 minutes or so. My name's Laura Hill. I head up Cloud Essentials in our UK region. And I'm joined by my colleague, Narika Maharaj, who is a very tech savvy, uh, very experienced legal and compliance specialist. And uh, my colleagues, Chris and Johan, are also going to join us um, towards the end for some Q&A um, to bring some more kind of technical perspectives. So we're going to start the session today with um, just a quick look at the basics of Microsoft 365 Copilot and some context, and then start to unpack the question, you know, is it is it safe? Um, present some assurances from Microsoft, but also make it clear what your side of the bargain is. And then we're going to get into the meat of the session, which is to give you a foundational framework for readiness um, and some practical suggestions for, for next steps to get ready. And then we will bravely open up the Q&A channel um, and attempt to answer some, some questions that we're sure you've got. Uh, please stick with us for that. Fire your questions into the chat. Um, it's a bit easier than the, than the Q&A. Um, and we will filter through and we'll answer what we can and um, you know if there's anything outstanding we'll try and we'll try and get back to you and the spirit of the session as well is also I suppose to set the tone for how Cloud Essentials as a partner want to work with you our clients and want to work with Microsoft um, in partnership around Copilot you know this is early days it's going to evolve. We're all on a on a learning curve here, but we've got experience to share and we want to work very collaboratively um, with you to, to navigate the co-pilot journey. So after this, you know, please connect with us on LinkedIn, um, ping, ping us on chat, on email, and we'll uh, we'll set up a conversation and yeah, see if we're a good fit for supporting you going forward. So for um, those of you who don't know us yet, um, we are speaking from a place of being a very long standing Microsoft partner around the area of content management. And it's why we're really excited about Microsoft 365 Copilot because it kind of builds on all the work that we do every day with our clients to migrate their content into the Microsoft Cloud um, as an ecosystem, you know, from legacy, from on premises, from third party platforms and to primarily create the conditions for that data to be secure, to be compliant, to be well managed, so that it can ultimately be used as a business asset, which is now you know, way more possible by harnessing the power of AI. And those who know us well will also know that we very much specialize in data governance and compliance. We've got deep expertise in deploying the Microsoft Purview feature stack, which are all those controls in Microsoft Cloud relating to compliance and governance. So yeah, we, we unashamedly look at Microsoft 365 Copilot through this lens, it's, it's in our DNA. And from early conversations, we suspect that tackling risk might be one of the more immediate and, and possibly the biggest hurdle um, to jump in the in the journey through Copilot. So let's get stuck in and uh, see what all the hype is about. So firstly, the array of Copilot. There's a family of them, um, and that is because the concept is that AI uh, is is to be deeply integrated into Microsoft applications and into workflow, more as, as a sort of extension of capability, not a separate tool that operates in isolation. So, you know, the recent wave of announcements and early adoption programs is centered around a number of different co-pilot solutions, different use cases, different outcomes. 
um, but all with the same sort of intention of being AI embedded into your world for, for productivity gains. So, you know, there's a sales, sales co-pilot for syncing up intelligence from collaboration activities and the CRM. There's security co-pilot, which is more about improving um, the identification of security issues, reporting, remediation. There's GitHub Copilot for developers to write better code quicker. And there's Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is where we are focusing today for content generation and getting insights out of, out of Office apps. And Microsoft have kind of coined the term your Copilot for work um, for, for this. So we figure you can watch the fancy videos at will. We will send some links to you after this session for some of the best ones. So go knock yourself out looking at those. But in a nutshell, uh, Microsoft 365 Copilot will give you this kind of helping hand, speeding up the process of creating new content based on what already exists and based on additional context that you give it. So perhaps in email, in PowerPoint, in Excel, um, you know, it can create those first drafts and also give you insights and, and summaries. So the basic example here that we're showing is, is it going on within PowerPoint for creating a presentation, for summarizing it and for formatting it. And you use natural language to make that request to Copilot. So it's much more natural extension of your thinking process. And the concept is that Copilot, um, yeah, it's not autopilot. You know, it needs it needs human input. You call on it with a prompt. It does its thing. You assess that output and then you take that workflow forward and use it to really automate the grunt work. Um, it's a productivity tool. It will get you to content outcomes quicker. It will cut through noise quicker to kind of allow you to focus your energy as a, as a human being on the work that really matters. And we don't want to clutter this session with the glossy sales pitch. This session is about readiness, um, but we do think it's important to have a bit of a grasp of uh, what's going on behind the scenes at a kind of simple level, mainly just for some comfort in what Microsoft are calling the, the trust boundary. So let's have a look at what's going on behind the scenes. So the magic happens across three core um, technologies to create this powerful knowledge model for your organization. The first being Microsoft 365 apps. So this is where your user prompts and, and the responses happen in Word, in Teams, in Outlook, Excel. The second being Microsoft Graph, which is your gateway to drawing intelligence out of your business content. And the third being the large language model. So this is where the Microsoft investment in, um, in partnership with OpenAI comes in. Large language models are, th are this type of AI algorithm that got deep, deep learning from very large data sets. And the instance here is maintained by Microsoft in Azure, and we will point you to, to more information about that. So very simply, um, in using Microsoft 365 Copilot, you, the user, create your prompt within your Office application. And then the process uses what's called grounding to improve the relevance of that prompt and make that call to Microsoft Graph to retrieve your business content, your contact. It's, it's grounding it in your local information. And then a much improved and modified prompt is sent to the large language model, which returns a result for post-processing back to Microsoft Graph for things like alignment with your security, your access controls, um, because the process will only return a response that you have access to. So then that response goes back to the user and those commands go back to the, to the application to, to execute on, on the task. And it's iterative, it's, it's constantly looping these processes. So a total oversimplification, um, but that's actually as far as we're going to go technically. We'll send links for more technical detail. But what we wanted to say here was that it's important to note this dotted line of the Microsoft 365 trust boundary and that the process is you taking from 
not giving into the large language model. So your data is not stored by or used to, to feed that large language model. So hold on to that image um, and Narika is gonna, gonna take uh, those thoughts a little bit further. Thanks, Laura, for providing us with that overview um, on Copilot and how um, the AI model has been built by Microsoft. So I guess the next question on everyone's mind is whether Microsoft's Copilot is safe and what steps has Microsoft taken to ensure um, responsible AI? So I think what's important here um, for our audience and just for anyone who wants to uh, build or bring Copilot into the environment is to understand that Microsoft did begin their responsible AI journey back in 2017. And this is when Microsoft committed to making sure their AI systems are developed in a way that warrants the end user's trust. Uh, the Microsoft Cloud as a whole runs on a trust system, and trust has been a fundamental promise that Microsoft has built into the Microsoft Cloud since the very beginning. As we all know, data is the fuel that powers um, the AI technology, including Copilot, and you need to trust what your technology partners are doing with your data and your organization's data, which is the most important, I guess. There are three fundamental promises that Microsoft makes. And firstly, the first promise basically is that your data remains your data. It does not become Microsoft's data. It remains your organization's data. That means um, it's yours to own and it's yours to control. And it, it remains your data and it remains your choice on how you want to leverage it and how you want to monetize it. Secondly, what's important is your data is not used to train or enrich the Microsoft AI model. Only your organization benefits from your data and your business processes that's inputted into the Copilot system. And thirdly, your data used within the AI model is in fact protected at every step by the most comprehensive enterprise compliance and security controls built by the Microsoft Information Protection Security Center in the industry. And that, that basically is Microsoft's commitment to you, and that commitment should give you the confidence and should give your organization the confidence to leverage the power of AI and Copilot to transform your, your business and basically enhance productivity and efficiency. And I guess now that we have that confidence in Microsoft's trust boundary within cloud and their AI model, I'm gonna hand over uh, back to Laura to just talk to us a bit about your board's appetite and the business case around AI, because that's another uh, springboard to get this journey started. Thanks, Nirika. Yeah, so I suppose to sort of get back above the the tree canopy of of what Copilot is to some broader context before we start talking about your readiness journey. You know, it's not even been a year really, so I don't think, since we learned about the investment in open AI. But it feels really quick now. Um, but as Narika says, this has been years in the making and AI isn't new. You know, I think what's what's new is bringing AI into the mainstream of modern work with, with Microsoft apps. And also what's new is the predictions of the pace of adoption versus other eras of transformation that we've been through. So, you know, Microsoft have made a whopping investment in this and they're really whipping up demand in the market. Um, Satya Nadella talks to AI entering a golden age that's gonna redefine work. Um, but I, I like this kind of hype curve concept for looking a bit more broadly at the market but also I think we can use it when we look introspectively at our organizations and where we're at with different forms of AI um, you know you can't use Copilot yet it's still in the early adoption program there's still a lot of lessons to be learned as it hits real world use cases and you know so that degree, the, the technology is kind of ahead of market readiness um, from that perspective. But in the meantime, you know, you've got your own hype curve to ride in your organization. And I think even for yourself as personally as a, you know, a professional in this new era um, and readiness could be a significant investment for your organization. And that pace and that um, 
turbulence maybe of your journey will will depend on how you ride your hype curve and, and the appetite at the top of your organization as well. Which leads me on to um, asking a question and some audience participation, if you'd be so kind. Um, what are you hearing amongst your senior executives and you know at board level within your organization about Microsoft Copilot? Um, so if you can, scan the QR code or click the link in the chat to cast your vote here. It's anonymous. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting just to get an indication which word best describes the tone at the top of your organization for Microsoft 365 Copilot. So I'm just going to pause whilst we watch it do its fancy thing. Some curiosity. There's some ambition for sure. I think there are there are a few of Microsoft colleagues on this call. You're probably going to skew the results here. Actually, I should have thought of that because we know your leadership is serious. Yeah, it's a little like down like anxious. That was going to be an interesting one. OK, yeah, a good a good range. We'll keep that coming in. That would be useful to feedback on as well. Um, but yeah, ambitious. The, the ambition is there for sure. And, you know, that's very much what we are seeing. If we've we've already spoken with organizations that are looking at the adoption of Copilot as a really strategic move, you know, as a, as a way to reduce costs, um, reduce time to revenue, seeing it as very critical to keeping up with or staying ahead of competition. But we also know there are organizations that will take a very cautious approach. Uh, one client said to us recently, you know, our guys still browse. They don't even use SharePoint search. Using AI is light years away. Um, and it is expensive. It is an investment. It's a, it's an add-on to a Microsoft license. And, you know, there will be that investment in, in readiness. And it's our prediction that the early winners, the organizations that will yield quickest, biggest return on their investment will be those who have very strong data productivity use cases. So reward is high on this vertical axis here, but where they also have a greater maturity level when it comes to data security, governance, compliance, so risk is lower. You know, so your ideal scenario here is to be up in that yellow zone, you know, going into this new era with some very tangible business benefits and for it to be a low risk game for you. And our prediction is that slower returns or dare I say it, maybe some early casualties uh, will come to organizations with less compelling use cases and maybe more at stake because of a shortfall in, in investment in reducing risk across their data estate. And we say this because we have we've seen this firsthand. Um, we deployed cognitive search solution for a professional services firm a while back now who wanted to use AI to get more value from their content. And their content was across a mix of several structured and unstructured data sources, um, user access permissions were applied according to those data sources. So the solution went live um, and the AI engine started to generate information from queries and, you know, amazing mind blown. Um, day two, mandate from board level, shut this thing down. Um, you know, what had transpired was that these locations, they weren't as locked down as they should have been. There were deficiencies in the you know, in core um, areas of Active Directory, meaning exposure to sensitive data. Q, months of permissions, hygiene, work, data to classification, etc. So, yeah, a lesson learned in risk mitigation, but more than that, actually, a lesson learned in the fact that readiness conversation needs to sit at senior exec at board level. And in our info sheet that we'll share with you, there's a link to a really good article from the Institute of Directors, um, a study they did on AI in the boardroom. And it did reveal a, a worrying lack of, of consciousness about AI at top levels, um, but very much a desire to bring 
governance of AI um, at project inception. So a desire not to have to unravel ethical risk issues later um, when there's a reputational or a, or a cost impact. You know, and these these people carry the responsibility and the risk. Um, so, you know, how do we empower our CDO leaders, leaders with the knowledge they need to make very well informed decisions on reward versus risk? Um, you know, so that we're not walking blindfolded into this into this hazard zone. And Narika is very familiar with guiding board level conversations around governance and compliance. So it's just going to share um, a little bit more thinking on this now. Perfect. Thanks, Laura. So I think just to build upon what Laura has said, um, and I think we have a common understanding that AI is a powerful tool and it does hold endless possibilities for your organization. But I think I want to reference a bit of uh, Spider-Man here where Peter Parker says, with great power comes great responsibility. And I guess the question on your mind and how do you take this forward to your C-suite executives is, how can your organization harness the potential of AI while ensuring this ethical use, addressing the biases in the models and protecting the privacy uh, of any personal information that you may be using within those AI models? And this is why today we think it's it's an important consideration to discuss governance before you embark on this co-pilot journey. Um, while the use of AI such as co-pilot can increase productivity and efficiency, it also poses ethical and privacy um, concerns, and your organization must address these uh, governance considerations to ensure success of your organization. The board, like we've mentioned, is responsible for establishing the organization's purpose and strategies, and they should adapt any existing controls, whether it's your people controls, your technology controls, or policies uh, to accommodate AI, as some of those may have become outdated and no longer apply within the new risks that come with AI. Um, at the board level, uh, they must also consider the implications of any new tool or technology introduced into their organization. And AI can bring strategic opportunities, but also significant risks, and the board should assess the risks um, as part of its risk appetite and make decisions on whether they're willing to accept those risks or what they need to do to mitigate any of the risks associated with those decisions to bring upon co-pilot or any AI into the organization. As responsible leaders, whether you sit within the first line of defense as uh, line management, whether you sit um, in compliance risk management, or even at a more senior management level, whether you're in internal audit, uh, it's crucial for you to encourage your board members to ensure their process, people, and technology controls effectively address the associated risks posed by the use of AI, because this will also help your organization to instill confidence uh, amongst your stakeholders, whether those be your internal or your external st stakeholders, and also just to safeguard um, the organization's future success, like Laura mentioned, uh, to prevent any reputational damage. But I think most importantly, what you need to take away from this slide or this aspect of your journey is before implementing AI, your organization should consider their decision making around uh, governance, uh, data security and your cultural values, uh, your cultural principles in your organization to account for potential impacts from AI. Um, although the governance journey can seem like a mountain, your organization can start by taking the following three steps, and this is something you can you can perhaps implement um, as your takeaway from this webinar. And by firstly, the first step to focusing towards um, effective AI governance is cre increasing compliance oversight. And what this means is basically establish robust policies to ensure that the AI is utilized in a res responsible and ethical manner. Perhaps you want to establish an acceptable usage policy where you break down how your users will use uh, Copilot and what they should and shouldn't do. And secondly, perhaps you want to look at addressing the scope of the AI and put measures in place to ensure responsible and ethical use. When it comes to AI governance, you need to make sure that your data is being used appropriately and that sensitive information is safeguarded. But we will unpack that one a bit later on. And then lastly, to ensure that AI systems are in line with your organization's culture and values, you can consider setting up a culture and values board or an ethics review board to assess and address the impact of AI on stakeholders. This way you can make sure that AI is benefiting everyone in a fair and responsible 
way. So basically, ensure if ensure effective governance within your organization. Make sure the decision makers have all the accurate assumptions about the level of risk involved in using Copilot. Uh, what's important as well is that Microsoft does share in some of this risk uh, with your organization. And Laura is just going to provide us with a breakdown of Microsoft's shared responsibility model. And this will also help ensure everyone involved is aware of their responsibilities and can make informed decisions on Copilot. Over to you, Laura. Thanks, Mika. Yeah, so I suppose to set the scene before we go into readiness, um, it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, in using Microsoft Cloud, you signed up to the shared responsibility model. You know, you take on the risk inherent in your data, your IP, the sensitive data you carry, the regulatory obligations that you have on you, your housekeeping duties. So whilst Microsoft rightly say that they do mitigate risk through Copilot, respecting your permissions, your policies, your controls, what if your permissions, your policies, your controls aren't in as healthy state as they could or should be. Uh, and Microsoft gives you this powerhouse of controls for all of this stuff. And where there are gaps maybe in the automation or administrative side of it, there's a sea of technology from third party vendors around this space. But maybe you've not been using that to its full potential. And maybe Copilot is now going to be a bit of a catalyst for accelerating adoption of, of better security, better governance, better controls. Um, and that's certainly where we come in as, as a partner to help you get more value from what you've got or, or are about to invest in um, for readiness. So I want to introduce to you now a um, our sort of foundational framework to help you think through your approach to readiness. And if we kind of think back to the risk reward uh, quadrant concept, our readiness framework is based on that hypothesis. You know, the organizations with that strong use case, that investment in optimization, combined with lower levels of, of risk um, are going to get bigger, faster return on investment. And that's why we think these are the areas that you should be talking about when looking at readiness for Microsoft 365 Copilot way before you start thinking about technical prerequisites and, and running a pilot scheme. And we also think you should be quite cautious about one size fits all very simplified readiness frameworks and assessments um, that you might come across. There's a lot of variables unique to your organization and you have your own starting point to all of this. So our suggestion is that you use a framework like this more as a kind of lens to take a view on your current state and therefore the levers that you might need to pull on some harder than others to get ready. So let's walk through our, our thinking, starting with the core here that is the business case. So using generative AI, it's about achieving a business outcome. You know, it starts with the identification of those business processes that are going to see a high positive impact. Perhaps use cases that currently require multiple people to generate content manually because AI kind of brings access to that broader knowledge and, and limits the number of um, subject matter specialists may be needed perhaps technical writing, perhaps marketing content, perhaps internal communication rather than external, perhaps content that requires quite a lot of um, iterative revisions. And we think it's gonna also be important to keep in mind where the natural workflow is happening. You know, is it in Microsoft 365? Where's that source data? Where's the output destined for? Does it all kind of play out end to end in Microsoft 365 applications or elsewhere? Are we talking about connectivity outside of that ecosystem? Because um, we think there will be a lot of kind of helping hand use cases, maybe an overwhelming number, um, but for really quite transformational use cases, it's going to be important, we think, to rally colleagues from different business units and really look at the art of the possible and the productivity potential that Copilot offers and just start mapping out what that might look like. Um, and you can be selective here. You know, it's, it's user based licensing. So we recommend choosing that group of users or a business use, uh, unit that's got um, potential for, for higher impact. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I saw a help post on one of the forums um, 
recently someone asking for some use cases to try out for Copilot because they were on the paid for early adoption program and they didn't know what to test. Um, so we highly, highly recommend that you sketch this out um, before you get your hands on the technology. And use cases is only one aspect of what we mean here by that core, that business case, which is more about, I suppose, the, the reasoning behind investing time, investing money, investing resource in this. And that's going to need to marry up with your strategic direction, the expectations um, that you have on that return, be it economic, be it purely um, competitive, um, realistic budget um, and over what time frame, you know, your stance on risk, what needs tackling when, uh, who are those stakeholders who's championing this from the top. And yeah, going back to our, our kind of risk reward concept, you know, you can't have a conversation about using your content for competitive advantage without that marrying up with a conversation about the conditions within which your content lives and is used um, and what risk might be lurking there. So Narika is now going to talk us through the next two areas of our framework for reducing risk. Thanks, Laura. So I think before I start off on the data security and data governance, we just want to add a preface to that, that we know a lot of people on the call probably have been on their journey to comply with POPIA or GDPR from a security and governance perspective. And this is this is more not al along the lines of compliance journey, but more your journey to help you through your tools that you already have at your disposal from Microsoft uh, to get you ready for this co-pilot journey. So starting off with data security, which is the first leg of your readiness journey for co Copilot, thanks, Laura. So Microsoft 365 Copilot automatically inherits your company's valuable security compliance and privacy policies and processes for Microsoft 365. And that's firstly very important for you to understand. Um, but what does this mean? As Laura mentioned, Copilot works within the boundaries, the policies, and the permission structures and the controls you have in place in your existing environment. And you will already be well on your way to continuously improve your data security as part of your privacy and compliance journey. So this topic may not be new to you at all. But what we want to urge you to do, however, is to think about any areas that might need tightening up because Microsoft 365 Copilot might expose some vulnerabilities and we want you to be ready in this area. We want you to not have to shut Copilot down two days after deploying it because your board minutes perhaps have been surfaced to your junior office manager or perhaps a document containing personal information from a performance review got exposed. And we think your efforts to tighten up data security and privacy might center around three foundational areas. And we're going to just break those down. The first one being identity management, which focuses around uh, control to your data, uh, information protection and collaboration hygiene. But then again, the question is, why do you need to focus on these three areas? Well, let's quickly break it down. The first foundation of identity management. Let's first understand what that means. Like we all know the world is interconnected and we've got the Internet of Things and the world is mobile and our data is now everywhere. And there are very few hard boundaries to protect this data without you going in and putting something there to protect it. So data security and privacy depend on identity management and active directory or Microsoft Active Directory is your keystone to enable that. You will already have a lot going on in your environment, perhaps to mature your approach to managing Active Directory. You may already have established teams supporting you in that, but you might want to run some vulnerability checks and do some remediation ahead of adopting Copilot to prevent oversharing of your documents or your personal information. Um, for example, ensuring your discipline around role-based access control and ensuring hygiene around groups and finding any rogue nested groups that might trip you up is also very important in this journey. Sometimes when we at Cloud Essentials run health checks in our clients' environment, we do find groups within groups within groups, sometimes as far as four levels deep, and there's a risk. This is one of the common ways inappropriate or sensitive data gets overshared within your organization. We think you can also use your readiness phase for co-pilot 
to take stock of where you are with password control, your multi-factor authentication, and your privileged access management. Uh, but you may already be addressing these issues, but it might be that you need to just do a bit of gap analysis and speed up adoption, or perhaps find ways to mature these disciplines in your, envir in your environment or work to make them uh, on a bigger scale. And this is where we can support you as Cloud Essentials on this journey to enhance your identity management as the first foundation. And then just quickly moving on to foundation two, which focuses on information protection, but also on your sensitivity labels to protect your data wherever it may go. Uh, the second foundation is less of a warning about a privacy breach or a cybersecurity incident. And I want to put more of a positive spin on this because it's really more of an opportunity for you to think about how Microsoft can help you protect your sensitive data with the tools you may already have at your disposal. At, if, at any given time, um, our team at Cloud Essentials are working on projects to help clients deploy Microsoft sensitivity labeling through Microsoft Purview. And just yesterday, I was actually chatting with our head of our project management office, and we currently have five projects right now where for once all of our clients knew exactly what labels they needed while other clients are in a longer process of creating or starting off by creating their data classification taxonomy. And that's kind of where I put a legal and compliance to provide you with advice and to guide that conversation on developing your taxonomy. But what's actually very surprising um, to us is the amount of organizations with access to the Microsoft information protection capability and who are paying for the higher tier licenses to get it, but not are not tapping into that those tools and those resources at your availability. The protections you put on an item or your data rather, follow it wherever it goes. So once you switch those sensitivity labels on and you've perhaps encrypted the data and you share the data, that encryption tool is there with that piece of data. And this is how you protect your crown jewels. And it goes way beyond things like data loss prevention as well, which is a way of stopping data as it leaves your boundary. Using information protection properly is also your way of protecting data within any context, Copilot included. And identity management and information protection do go hand in hand here because it's no good having um, a confidential label on your board minutes if your lack of identity management hygiene actually renders it available to the masses in any event. And then just quickly moving on to foundation three, which is collaboration hygiene. And just to make this a bit more easier to understand, uh, the third area of caution is around the additional complexity of data security, where there are high levels of collaboration within your organization, where multiple teams may be working together and sharing different types of information within your organization. So where Microsoft Teams and SharePoint point are being used as intended, but Teams going viral has left a web of complex permissions and sharing at an individual item level. And this was something we helped a lot of organizations with post COVID lockdown when Microsoft Teams took off with no time to prepare for security and governance best practices before switching on the technology. And that's again, a risk for any organization. We all learned um, those painful lessons and tackled it, although retrospectively for many organizations. But if you still have concerns around your SharePoint permissions and governance policies, now might be the best time to address them before the deployment of Copilot in your environment. We work also with a large pharmaceutical um, organization who have now rolled out a global solution to automate an uh, to automate the administration, sorry, uh, around teams creation and define the life cycle of items as they get created. Um, that's going to serve them well for Copilot because they've matured that environment, especially from a data security perspective, but also improved their data governance. And that leads me to the next consideration of Copilot readiness framework, which is your data governance considerations. So what we need to understand here is that Microsoft 365 Copilot is best suited for those organizations who have a solid foundation of data governance and have a well-rounded data governance strategy. So that's something you need to start thinking about already. 
by being knowledgeable about your data governance, you will be better prepared to actually take advantage of what Microsoft 365 Copilot has to offer your organization. That's because efforts for data governance will both reduce your data governance risk, but it will also optimize results for Copilot. And that's what you want to, uh, that's your end goal. That's what you want to actually achieve. And I think it should be top of the agenda in your co-pilot steering committee meetings. And that's something that I'm really passionate about and would love to help your organizations with. Data governance is obviously about ensuring that your data is accurate, complete, reliable, and secure. And the main decisions you might need to gear up for, if not done so already as part of your privacy uh, compliance journeys, are your retention policies. Have you looked at those? Have you revised them? Have you brought them into compliance with GDPR and POPIA? I see um, the whole spectrum in my work as an advisor in this space from organizations uh, are two opposite ends. Some with very aggressive retention policies, they see holding data as uh, predominantly a risk. And then you get the other opposite end of the spectrum to those who still have a keep all forever mentality. And that's also once again a high risk for organizations and something that they need to start considering. But whatever your stance and your organization's decision is, if you are not using retention management properly across your Microsoft um, 365 tenant, I urge you to get to grips with how it works in the Microsoft environment and be bolder in using retention and disposition policies because again, they are available with your licenses. The biggest barrier I see to that happening is indecision from senior leadership. Um, when we often host our purview adoption panel sessions, it's usually the elephant in the room, but not for long because I make sure it's basically tackled and a discussion point um, for everyone in the room. Um, and then just moving on to our next slide here on the top agenda items. Most importantly, I think to ensure high quality data and a richer co-pilot experience. It's not just about the quantity of data at your disposal, but also about how well your organization's data is governed. As a takeaway from this webinar, um, I think it's important to ensure the following are top agenda items in your discussion around your data governance strategy with your top leadership. The first agenda item being identification of your organization's stale data. Um, regularly review and analyze your data because this is crucial for efficient decision making and for your regulatory compliance, but also making sure um, you identify and remove any outdated or irrelevant information to ensure accurate and useful responses from Copilot. Additionally, make sure that you're taking preventative measures to ensure Copilot only uses data indexed by the Microsoft Search Service because this will also maximize the benefit for your users. And then as a second agenda item, um, archiving or deletion of your data, just making sure you are retaining only necessary data as this is also crucial for ensuring efficient and effective outputs uh, from your co-pilot responses. If you're retaining outdated data and it's um, pulling through the wrong uh, contracts or the wrong um, terms or conditions, then that's also going to give you incorrect outputs. And then lastly, just looking at your retention policies, uh, to ensure the relevance of data and compliance with regulations, it is important to, to implement uh, policies for archiving or deleting stale data based on your organizational and regulatory needs. And then once again, before I close out on this topic, I just want to reiterate that the richness of your co-pilot experience depends largely on the data sources that you have within your organization and that are indexed in your Microsoft 365. Um, tenants with the most abundant data in their Microsoft 365 will get the best results from Copilot. And with access to comprehensive organizational data, Copilot can suggest more relevant personalized content based on the user's work context and preferences. Uh, by implementing good data practices, you can now begin optimizing your content for Copilot. And then I guess just to guide us through the final two areas on optimization of your content and the change management, uh, Laura is just going to take us through those. Thanks, Nariko. <clears throat> yeah, so very much an extension from, from data governance. You know, when it comes to optimization, we're talking about improving that quality, getting more from Copilot. And that's a lessons learned game um, predominantly. You know, we are early days. 
uh, there will be best practices to be, um, you know, to be mindful of. But, you know, we we know that your uh, investment in data governance will play, pay off here in, in optimization. And, you know, also it might be that you um, think about exclusions and boundaries and more precision about what's made available to Copilot. And maybe you're more selective on those user groups because of the known quality levels of the content that they work with. You know, maybe you work with business functions that have a bit more structure to their concepts. And we actually think organizations well placed here of those for whom knowledge management is alive and kicking in their business. You know, we work with a number of legal firms in the area of knowledge management and Legal firms have generally been late adopters to cloud, um, but we wonder actually whether they might have the upper hand here. You know, they often invest in the value of their content. They they structure it. They organize people, process, technology around it. They tag, they they classify, they categorize, um, they lifecycle manage their content. Sometimes they have knowledge managers, you know, full time positions dedicated to championing and understanding knowledge. And, you know, if you look as well where Microsoft have gone with Viva Topics, for example, you know, there's this really cool concept there of curating content, because the better you do this stuff, um, the bigger, better results that you will get. But also just to note here, I suppose worse than low quality output is is maybe inaccuracy and inaccurate answers. And that's where we enter a bit of an unknown, a bit of a complex conversation about bias and about inaccuracies. You know, when a large language model generates something that maybe might sound plausible, but actually doesn't match up, you know, doesn't match the information it was given. And there are a lot of guardrails against this um, and only time will tell, I think. Um, but trust will need to build over time um, and a, you know, probably a, the rationale will likely be a level of acceptance of that, but that the net result um, will be that using AI, using Microsoft 365 Copilot puts you further ahead. Um, but we're going to see a lot more guidance, I think, from, from Microsoft on the area of optimization best practices. So watch this space on that. Um, but what's also going to serve you in ensuring this kind of quality in, quality out equation is the prompts from users and how they respond to the output that they get. And that brings us on to a conversation about change management. And yeah, skilling up is, is a big investment. And in our opinion, Copilot is going to need a significant change management thread throughout readiness and adoption and maturity. You know, maybe right now your users are still struggling with change to Microsoft 365 itself. You know, maybe they still actually think very much about content in silos and browsing and not really embraced um, the culture of, of kind of teams and searching. And that's potentially going to mean a bigger journey to go on here. It is a new way of working, being conversational with an AI sidekick. Um, it's new. So to get the best from it, you know, we will have to teach people how to use natural language prompts. It's it's very it's a very big mind shift from using search engines where you enter search terms in a very sort of broken up way. You know, we've gotten great at Googling. This is now about that art of of questioning and prompting um, to get the give it the context to get better output. And that's quite a big habitual change. So, I mean, we recommend start playing around with um, with Bing chat. Um, oh, we're doing all the slides here. There we go. Uh, if you haven't already, it is pretty cool. Um, I've been asking all sorts of questions, including one to write a poem about Copilot, but it was um, it didn't quite cut it. It didn't make it into the webinar. Um, but go and play and encourage people to to, to play with it, um, to get more familiar with what it means to use natural language as as prompt. But we also think there's a behavioral direction needed here about when it should be used and for what intended outcomes. So Narika um, uh, talked about this, you know, from a from a governance and perspective, um, but that needs to play itself out into end users through some kind of change management program. Uh, you know, we're hiring at the moment and I've already thrown out a candidate based on a reply that they sent to me on email that was so blatantly AI generated. Uh, and it's such a shame because she was looking promising. Uh, but yeah, you know, we we might have these great 
AI generated meeting summaries, you know, but did we actively listen and participate in that meeting? Does that matter? You know, we might have draft version one of an email response, but did we think about calling that colleague instead? Um, you know, we think we will have to start looking at creating some kind of guidance, some kind of policy about when it should be used for maximum impact and minimum risk and, you know, answer the question, who makes the decision on that? Because the onus is ultimately on the user to prompt for and then reason over what gets generated and be accountable for that and accountable for its onward journey. So maybe we'll start to see, you know, policies being developed to add that kind of layer of quality control and also maybe a bit more consciousness um, about sensitive data. And lastly, you know, we think change management is not just for end users. Leadership are going to go on a change journey here for their contribution to the oversight of Copilot um, and that kind of ongoing responsible management of, of this technology. So just to kind of bring us to land here uh you know our thoughts here to go away with are this is going to be a journey we think readiness should require broader thinking than just very basic prerequisites checks and, and pilots um you know and because not all readiness efforts will be equal we've suggested today some areas which might need more investment um than others and you know be aware of that of that shift you know this isn't a new app this isn't a new technology implementation it is um the start of a bit of a shift in in a way of working and you know not to not to underestimate that and to start being realistic about that roadmap for adoption so that you can budget appropriately um, and plan appropriately your readiness efforts um, over the next financial year for you and that's where we want to help as a partner, you know, to help you land your roadmap for readiness and then bring our skills and experience where you need it for execution on this. You know, we we don't believe in that one size fits all approach. Um, rather, we hope that we can bring a framework to help you figure out what your priorities are um, and where you need to kind of dial things up a level to get ready. So for us, the first part of that is creating a co-pilot readiness roadmap which doesn't start with technology assessments um, in our world it starts with people and it starts with setting up a panel and that's because we've learned the hard way maybe <laughs> that assessments are only as good as the decision making that they inform you know those Aha, moments um, and, and decisions that come out of doing any kind of gap analysis. You know, you can assess your vulnerabilities and short day and shortfalls and, and problems all day long. What you actually need ready and waiting is that vehicle to take action on it. You know, that that vehicle to formulate the solution, those decision makers with the authority to then drive it forward. Um, and yeah, you can you can host uh, art of the possible workshops all day long as well but you know if the right people are not there in the room getting inspired by it to act on it then we don't think there's any point in doing it um you know we've learned from our services delivering adoption of microsoft purview that the value we bring is not just in being subject matter specialists but also being facilitators of this decision making um contributing to steering committees or forging one for you if you don't have one already to get the right people in the room um, to drive the conversation forward. So that's where we we start. Then we look at the nature of the gap analysis work that you might need to do um, to get ready. Um, you know, you might already have full visibility of sensitive data and, and really be on things. You might already have a change management team. You just need to plug this into it. Um, so this is where we could help you assess your starting position so that all of this can then roll into a readiness roadmap that is realistic, um, you know, it's logical and it's already owned by your panel of decision makers to drive it forward into into execution. So it might seem a lot up front, but we can testify to how much uh, quicker programs pick up pace uh, by taking this approach. And yet one area that we're supporting clients with on who are wanting to mobilize quickly with Copilot is purview adoption, you know, to the points Narika made earlier. Microsoft gives you a ton of tools to take action on this and the more mature you are, the better value return you will get from the whole Microsoft offering 
now and, and future developments. Um, and our methodology for, for really accelerating purview adoption is it's proven in very highly regulated, uh, very fast moving industries like pharmaceuticals. So if you need to pick up the pace with purview, then, uh, then we're ready when you are. So we're going to close out there um, before we do some, some Q&A. Um, I haven't had a quick look at the chat yet, but yeah, a heads up that you can expect to hear from us on email with a hemp full um, sort of links sheet where we've curated some really good articles that we think will help you, especially non-technical senior execs to get them up to speed. And you can ping us on email or go through your Microsoft contacts to arrange an initial consultation with us. My colleague Sally will, will help coordinate times and dates. Um, and if you want to do that sooner rather than later, um, I suggest you, you get in touch. Um, the team are getting quite busy, as you can imagine, over the next month. And we post regularly um, our content on our blog and LinkedIn feed. So yeah, so do subscribe to get um, get up to date information as we kind of go on this learning curve. So thank you for listening.